All right, I can hardly believe it. We are in the last video of the Bible is History course. And so congratulations for following through. We have been through all 12 of Dr. Wilmington's basic stages in the Book of Ages. And uh, so now we are sitting right at the end of what we'll call the Apostolic Age, the time of the 12 disciples. So it is the time from their call into ministry under Christ up until the time of their individual deaths. And uh, the last disciple, John, dies around 95 or 96 AD. So at the close of the century comes the close of the Apostolic Age. Each disciple sealed his witness with his own life. Um, so all of the disciples, except for John, died as martyrs. So their witness to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is incredibly important because if they were telling a tale, uh, would they have sealed that tale, 12 of them, with their own blood? So it's powerful evidence for a true life of Christ, a true death, and a true resurrection. John only was the one of natural who died of natural causes. Uh, he was exiled to Patmos, and we read about that in the book of Revelation. And then tradition tells us that he was released just before his death from Patmos, where he returned to Ephesus, and the tale is that every Sunday they would carry his bed into the church, and they would ask what message John had for the church, and his answer every single Sunday was love each other. They'd pick his, pick his bed up, take him back out. The next Sunday the message was the same thing until he died, and he died um, perhaps, as we said, 95, 96 A.D. So the authority that the gospel came with originally resided in the disciples of Jesus Christ. They were the ones who walked with him. They were the ones who heard his teaching. They were the ones that saw his miracles. They were the ones who knew him before his death and saw him after his resurrection. So the authority was there. And then as they grew older, um, one by one, they would write letters, and those letters would be passed around. And uh, with Paul adding about half the New Testament, um, we rarely in these early years had a complete collection. So if you passed, let's say, the book of Colossians to me, I would read it with great vigor. I would uh, write it out, perhaps for myself and my own congregation, and then I would pass it along, and I would wait till somebody brought me the book of James or uh, something written by John or Peter. So the letters were passed around, and, and nobody seemed to, at the very beginning, have all of them. It was rare to find a complete collection. Uh, but what happened is uh, later, after the apostolic age, uh, into the early into the into the church age, um, a heretic, a false teacher named Marcion, uh, began to cut and paste out of the Gospels and out of some of the other New Testament writings what he liked and then threw out what he didn't like. And so the church reacted to his cut and paste method of putting together a canon of Scripture by coming up with the one true canon um, and recognizing the Holy Spirit's work in those apostolic writings. So eventually the authority spread from the apostles to the things that they'd written until after their death, what we have left is that written word of God. Let's talk a little bit more about it. The word canon means uh, a, a straight edge, a line, a standard. And so what books that were available written in the first century or second century, had many books had been put forward as possible inclusion in Scripture. And so which ones would rise to the level of showing the imprimatur of the Holy Spirit?
um, and which ones would fall short. Now, the, some theologians list um, many different criteria for choosing which books would fit in the canon and which not, but almost all of them boil down to two possibilities, and the one that is almost always primary and perhaps the the reason why that book is included is was the book related to attached to written by somehow an apostle of Jesus Christ to one of the disciples uh, so if it was written by an apostle or related to an apostle and it was written for edification if the church found it valuable then it was included so that brought uh, many of Paul's books uh, into the canon. It brought uh, the Gospels. John Mark was um, related to the Apostle Paul. Um, the book of Hebrews was related to the Apostle Paul. Um, so the, by and large, uh, the books of the New Testament were settled ones. Some of the disputed ones were the book of Hebrews, because it doesn't start out by saying Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And uh, we argued in another uh, video that the, the book is different because it's a sermon and not an epistle. Uh, so the answer is in the genre. But because it didn't have Paul's name attached for a while, the book of Hebrews was a disputed book. The book of James was a disputed book. Uh, mainly because it seems to stress uh, works as well as faith, and uh, and then the book of Revelation, uh, because it's the book of Revelation, <laughs> and it's hard to interpret, but it comes with a promise, a blessing, that if we read it and study it, um, that it will reward us. Um, so those are books, are dis books that were disputed for a time, but eventually included in the canon. Then there were a couple of books, that uh, writers liked. Um, some even advocated that they be added to Scripture, but were in the end rejected. Um, they included such books as the Shepherd of Hermas and the Didache and uh, most of the pseudepigraphal writings. Pseudepigraphal means false, false writing, which means somebody in the second century and later decided that uh, we needed an epistle from this New Testament character or that one, and so they pretended to be that person in order to provide moral teaching, in order to provide um, religious teaching, but it, because they were pretending that we knew that wasn't actually written by Mary Magdalene or someone else, uh, those pseudepigraphal books were rejected by the church. Let's talk a little bit more about the Shepherd of Hermas and the Didache. Um, a couple famous church fathers, Clement of Alexandria and Irenaeus, um, rather liked the Shepherd of Hermas and thought it ought to be included in Scripture. In the Shepherd of Hermas, the shepherd is Christ, and Hermas is a slave turned businessman, and there's a conversation between the two and uh, on uh, religious and moral topics. So that's the Shepherd of Hermas. The Didache um, was considered the teaching of the Twelve Apostles, um, and it had four sections to it. Uh, the first section discussed the two ways, sort of the broad way and the narrow way, as Jesus taught. Um, those two ways, second section, had to do with how to accomplish the rituals of the church, like baptism and communion. The third section had to do with how you treat traveling evangelists and their hospitality. And then the fourth section discussed the return of Christ. Uh, so that's the Didache. The first copies of Scripture, it's interesting to, to look at. They're called codexes or codices. Um, and they were made from sheep or goat skin. And one side was rougher than the other side, actually. The hairy side with all the, uh, was rougher than the flesh side. So it, one was more of a challenge to the, to the writer. 
uh, the copyist who was copying the Word of God. Um, and so those sides were usually matched. So the, the rough side went with a rough side, went with a rough side, and the smooth sides were all together so that the copyist would not have to change his technique back and forth all the time. Um, but these were the original documents, the, the original things that were written on to preserve the Word of God. So that's basically how we got uh, Scripture and why some books were included and some not. Remember apostleship and remember edification. Because if it were possible that we could find, let's say, the Apostle Paul's grocery list, we would not assume that that writing was inspired. The reason is it's not very edifying. It would be curious and it would be kind of interesting to note, but it wouldn't matter as far as scripture. Um, so balancing those two things, apostleship and edification, helps us to understand why the books that were available at the time to be included in scripture, which ones were and which ones weren't. I'm going to conclude this series. Man, I've loved meeting with you and uh, sharing uh, these small lessons, and I hope that uh, they have been a help. Um, I'm going to conclude with the same benediction that John does at the end of Revelation. Uh, John writes, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And John writes, The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. With that, thanks for listening.